دكتور الخطيب تفضل Hello, hello to all, hello to everybody, dear all. Uh, on behalf of AMAC and CRG boards, I'm welcoming all of you in our live and interactive broadcast from ABC Educational Courses on different topics in oncology. Today, we will talk about breast cancer and the objectives of our meeting of today is to discuss the recent advances in the treatment of luminal ABC, overall survival data with CDK4-6 inhibitors. Also, we are going to talk about the targeting PI3K and other mutations in ABC. The breast cancer module of today, we are going to talk about the power of choice in luminal advanced breast cancer we are welcoming our colleagues from all our MENA area, in addition to people attendees from France, Switzerland, Britain, Iran, United States, Spain, Greece, and South Africa. You are welcome all, and I'm going to let uh, now Dr. Fadi Farhat, who is the president of the CRG, to talk uh, and to give us an introduction. You are welcome. Thank you, Dr. Sami. Uh, thank you for all uh, our friends joining us uh, for this course. Uh, uh, indeed, I would like to thank also uh, Science Pro, who's uh, supporting us greatly in this activity. Uh, a reminder about our course, uh, the ABC Oncology course that started in 2014 uh, on a yearly basis. This is a course that is mainly uh, organized uh, that is mainly concerning the uh, the the topics of uh, oncology in different fields so uh, we have different modules uh, by uh, by a disease area and every module is uh, co uh, containing multiple um, uh, multiple uh, sessions so uh, today can i see this, the next slide please so Can I have my slides? Okay. So today I will be uh, discussing uh, the in the first session uh, of our uh, uh, of our ABC ABC. I can't see the presentation. Okay. Where I have it. So here, my presentation for today, it's the first ABC educational course and uh, the first session in the breast module. I will present the case of a woman, young woman, 44 years old, female, premenopausal, uh, that I saw almost uh, 17 or 18 months ago. She has a severe anemia. 5.5 hemoglobin, uh, fecal occult blood negative, ferritin normal, and she has a, a height, a, a Coombs negative, uh, direct and indirect, no signs of hemolysis, and the bone marrow was not really uh, 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 as it was not expressive, and we gave her, uh, we gave her a transfusion, and on clinical exam we showed that she has a breast mass. So we did an MRI and we observed a bilateral breast mass and subcutaneous, as you can see on slide, subcutaneous lesions. We went to do a bone marrow and a, 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 a breast biopsy. The bone marrow showed a metastatic breast globular carcinoma, luminal A type. And the breast biopsy and the skin biopsy showed the same type of disease. So we were facing a, an aggressive breast cancer with um, uh, lobular bilateral uh, breast cancer metastatic to, to, to the bone marrow, metastatic uh, uh, to the uh, uh, mesentery cliff node, metastatic to subcutaneous region. As you can see on this uh, bar, on this uh, slide, 
Here is the bulk of the disease, 100%. Here, the CA15-3 and the CE8. I made it this way to, uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to observe it later on. But in such case, premenopausal women with breast cancer, uh, my, my concern was, should we behave differently? Because we know very well that premenopausal women had usually poor outcomes. The progression may occur in the first year and the five year survival is low in metastatic setting concerned to the other patients. And the factors that may contribute to this bad prognosis in such cases is the fact that the biology is different. So as you know, the biology in the premenopausal cancer is different. We know also that in premenopausal cancer, we have a grade, a higher grade, and there is uh, more possibilities to, 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 to get the diagnosis on advanced stage. And it's very important for us also, when we talk about premenopausal women, because my patient was premenopausal in, in, when she started the treatment, the psychological and emotional challenge in this case. Remember that these, these, these patients are mothers, are spouses, so they have, they have to look at their body image, they have to look at their uh, uh, spouse and children. They have concern about their sexuality, loss of fertility. So the treatment is somehow and should be different. And they have a longer uh, survival if, if you can achieve a cure. And they have a lot of symptoms that may affect their quality of life. And it's distressing for them because uh, uh, these people are working uh, women. So first of all, I had a concern about the uh, uh, menopausal status. Second, a concern about the visceral lesions, because also we know that talk all the time about the aggressivity and uh, the bad prognosis of these visceral lesions. And here I, I can tell you that visceral metastases that we see, we see usually are not the same that vis like visceral crisis, because in visceral crisis, the, the prognosis is, is, is more aggressive, is worsening with time. That's why we have to differentiate between visceral crisis and visceral metastasis. And my patient had hemoglobin 5.5. So in my opinion, I have to consider it as aggressive disease. Also, what to do as treatment? Young patient and we, with, with bone marrow involvement, with, with visceral metastasis, uh, probably we have to go for chemotherapy. That's what we used to do. But with time, with the progression of the on the crying therapy, we know very well since the development of the, of the concept of anti-estrogen with uh, Bitson in 1896 with the first oophorectomy, then after the, uh, the, the tamoxifen, the aromatase inhibitor, then after fulvestrone, the estrogen receptor degrader, then after the, the, the mTO and the CDK inhibitor, we understand, we know, and we are convinced that the combination is better between targeted therapy and immuno and, and uh, hormonal therapy. And the CDK brought an important uh, clinical footprint in the evaluation of the treatment. Why and how CDK are acting? We know very well that the final idea is to act on the, on the development, on the, on the uh, activity of the, uh, uh, of the uh, mitosis. And we know that the CDK inhibitors will work and will act on the cyclin D through the uh, uh, RB uh, anti-oncogen, uh, anti, uh, oncogen, which is the active tumor suppressor gene, the retinoblastoma gene. We know that when we stimulate the, the, cycling, uh, the cycling D when we, uh, by the PI3K or the ER or MAP uh, pathway, there will be an inactivation of uh, the retinoblastoma, which will uh, lead to the uh, activation of the cycle. But if we inhibit that, then after we can observe a, uh, a, 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 a stopping, an early uh, stopping of this uh, cycle. Also, in, in a premenopausal woman, young woman, mother and wife and worker woman, I would think about the toxicity profile. So yes, I have to choose a medication that will not have a serious impact, but we know that nowadays, uh, all the guidelines uh, are describing the toxicity and are, 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 uh, in, in the ABC and the ESMO and the ASCO. And we know that they all ask us to make an evaluation for all uh, possible symptoms prior to treatment, during and after the treatment. And we know also that the cardiac 
association uh, uh, is asking for a cardiac evaluation in all patients at baseline, indifferently of age, independently of age and, uh, and uh, aggressivity. So with that, I have a bilateral breast cancer patient with peritoneal mesenteric skin and bone marrow metastasis. And I need evidence. It's not time for hunches. It's time for evidence. So what do we have as, as evidence? What are the questions that I ask myself? Is it mono or combo? We said that probably combo. If CDK, and we have to give CDK, is my patient receiving it in first line? Second, is the disease rapidly progressing? Is the disease uh, aggressive? What might be my next uh, treatment? What's the algorithm? Because you know the oncologist will put an algorithm in his head in order to follow first, second, third step. How can I prolong the benefit of my treatment? And if I I, I think of the quality of life, the toxicity. I will ask my th myself, what CDK will I choose? At this time, uh, we had a lot of trials, as you can see, with the Monarch trials that and, and Paloma and Mona Lisa that explored different type of patients. So, what's at the advantage for the uh, Mona Lisa trial? In my opinion, it was a clearly studying the endocrine sensitive, which is the case of my patient. It's the same as Monarch and Paloma 2, but also the Mona Lisa 3 is exploring all the possibilities. So this made my, uh, my, uh, this made my decision that I have to go and uh, give the, uh, the, the ribocyclic based on uh, this work. At this also, we, uh, uh, I was supported only by the data showing an overall uh, the, the PFS. The PFS cannot be compared from studies, but it was the higher in Mona Lisa, knowing that there is a difference, the hazard ratio was the same, meaning that the impact was the same. But I decided to start with the ribocyclib, uh, and uh, also I have to say that I would like to have an overall survival benefit when I treat my patient, and I think that you agree an overall survival a benefit will be uh, more uh, uh, convincing for us and uh, 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 for our chance, um, despite that many factors usually impact the, uh, the overall survival benefit, uh, and that's why achieving a statistical significance is, is different because of different demographics, baseline characteristic, different because of the prior therapy, etc., because of the sample it was usually, it's not easy to get an overall survival benefit. And in the last uh, uh, quarter, the, uh, the last uh, 25 years, we couldn't uh, have a real impact on the survival. Only few studies with, uh, with tamoxifen, everolimus, and filvestron and astrozole. So it was for our, uh, for our uh, surprise and uh, happiness that we started seeing overall survival. The first was, with the uh, Mona, uh, with the Mona Lisa, but I will here by alphabetic order. I will start that abimaciclib could show an overall survival benefit as CDK inhibitors, not in perimenopausal, but in all in all the patients. The study included pre and uh, postmenopausal. Paloma three uh, was not able to show uh, uh, to, sh to the, the Paloma three was not able to show this benefit. Uh, but in but the Paloma but the uh, the the, the palbocyclib could in real world data with the flatrion show that uh, there is a noble all survival benefit. But I remind you that the phase three has more power. So the Paloma three couldn't show in the trial that and the overall survival with Mona Lisa showed an almost thirty percent reduction of death with a uh, with a. Uh, uh, um, uh, Three years survival, 67% versus 58%. So it was the first study since approximately 20 years showing a substantial uh, overall survival benefit. And as you can see, uh, the, the overall survival, uh, the median overall survival was not yet reached, uh, reached in the uh, ribocyclic arm, while in the placebo arm it was uh, 40 months. And it's, it had a very significant p-value and almost 28% uh, uh, reduction of deaths, which is really incredible in such uh, cases of patients. And that's why it was recommended 
in all uh, uh, in all guidelines. So here is my patient. I decided to start with the treatment with uh, uh, the combination of ribocyclib with aromatase inhibitor as per the trial. And I can see that first I observed an increase in my marker. This can be observed with, from time to time. But at the first evaluation, as you can see, the bulk of the disease decreased from 100% to more than 50%. And the patient was... Uh, was, was in partial remission and the tumor work, markers start to, in, to decrease. And we can see that lesion that we previously uh, what was seen in the breast or in the subcutaneous region decreased. So a partial remission. And then after, with time, this continued to, uh, to, 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 be, to, be, uh, uh, to be seen. And as you can see, the last evaluation, the three months ago, ago, at 19 months from the beginning, the patient was in complete remission. SUV was showing no activity in the breast mass. The tumor mark normalized the PS zero. So excellent result in my opinion. So since my patient is a premenopausal, I would like to talk about the only trial that was ex that explored the CDK inhibitors in the uh, in the premenopausal setting. And here. Uh, to, to, to chickens. I have to face it. I haven't led an egg in a week now. I'm menopausal. So it's not my concern today, the menopausal. I will talk about the premenopausal, about the Mona Lisa 7, which randomized patients that has premenopausal situation, luminal A disease with no prior endocrine therapy and with one or no chemotherapy previously. So patients could have Receive first line of chemotherapy, and the 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 the, the, uh, the disease was stratified by the presence of or absence of lung liver metastasis, prior or not chemotherapy, and the partner tamoxifen versus aromatase inhibitors, and the treatment was uh, ribocyclib 600 milligram daily three tablets, so 200 three tablets, three weeks on one week off with tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors with gozerilin for these patients versus the same treatment without the ribocyclib. The primary endpoint, the primary endpoint was the PFS, progression-free survival locally assessed, and the secondary endpoint, and it was a key endpoint, the overall survival. Also, we had the response rate, the clinical benefit, and the safety. So patients were treated until uh, toxicity or death or loss uh, lost of follow-up. Okay, and the evaluation was performed every eight weeks for 18 months, then FT every two, 12 weeks. And we can see here that the patient who received ribocyclib had a rapid and sustained efficacy. We can see that the median PFS was 27 in the, in the, uh, in the uh, explored arm um, um, ribocyclib with hormonal therapy versus 13%, 13.8. It's almost doubling the PFS. Patients with visceral disease also had a very good response, and the visceral PFS was 23, 24 months compared to 27 for the whole population. Look, it was even worse in the arm, placebo arm. So the, there was a substantial benefit also in the case of visceral metastatic disease. And the overall response rate was almost 50 was 50 percent and more compared to 36 percent. So as you can see, uh, th there is an interesting, very interesting uh, result for the use of the combination endocrine therapy plus ribocyclib in the premenopausal setting. And I have to say to mention that the the curves uh, uh, were split early in uh, split early, so saying that the, the time to response was really good. And just to remind you that all the data of ribocyclib is showing a similar hazard ratio, which is excellent. I'm so happy because I see that our participant uh, achieved the one the number, achieved 100. Thank you. So what about the PFS in different subgroups? You know very well that it might work in some subgroups, in those with different PF, uh, P, uh, performance status, different uh, um, uh, hormonal status, presence or not of visceral diseases on, in, in bone-only diseases with prayer chemotherapy, 
No, there was no difference. All in this plot, we, plot we see that all subgroups had a substantial uh, benefit uh, uh, when you give the treatment, even if the patient has received pre previously uh, chemotherapy. In some cases, it, it can cross the barrier, but it's, the reason is the low number of patients. So in my opinion, it was a, a, a positive in all subgroups. And when it comes to the quality of life, again, I would like to mention that the quality of life in a work, uh, work, in working woman, mother, and, uh, and wife, uh, and you know the, the, the heavy tasks that uh, she has, uh, it's important. The quality of life was almost the same. There was no change in the quality of life for both arms. So very interesting, the overall survival. During the treatment, the overall survival benefit was published and I was very happy, my patient was very happy. We could see that the overall survival advantage of ribocyclic plus endocrine therapy was there. The hazard ratio was 0 0.7 with significant p value and the median, the, the median overall survival was not reached in the arm of ribocyclib while it was 41 month in the arm of endocrine therapy plus placebo. It's very important guys because uh, we know now that the overall survival benefit um, is, is substantial. It's 30% decrease of death and we have a survival at, uh, at uh, three uh, years and a half, about 70%. So in my opinion, since it's in all subgroups, positive results, even in bone metastasis only, even with one line of chemotherapy, this means that I have to use, I have to prescribe whenever it's possible, this treatment for these premenopausal women, and later on, it was approved also in postmenopausal with the Mona Lisa too. So ribocyclib, Kiskali is really there showing a significant uh, difference, a significant advantage of overall survival. And then after, uh, the authors went to study the, uh, the ribocyclib, not with both, but only with aromatase inhibitors, uh, overall survival. And it seems that the, uh, the potential is higher also because the hazard ratio is also better, 0 0.69 versus 7, 0 0.73. And the, the uh, three and a half year survival also was higher, showing that this medication should be used with aromatase inhibitors always because it's giving better results. So what to say again, that with aromatase inhibitor, the ribocyclib is giving higher benefit combined uh, in premenopausal status. And uh, that's why we are using that uh, nowadays for our patients. So if the PFS showed in benefit in all subgroups, that's also the case of overall survival in all subgroups uh, approximately. So it was really nice uh, to see that the, the data was consistent uh, for all subgroups. Uh, now we have to talk about the, the, the safety, as I said before, the, 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 these patients are workers, are young, are uh, active. The safety profile was very uh, acceptable and to tolerable in this uh, treatment. The reduction was in 33% of cases in uh, the uh, ribo arm compared to 6% in placebo arm plus endocrine therapy. But let, let me tell you that it was published also that when you decrease the dose of CDK, you have still uh, the same benefit in uh, the reduction of uh, progression or in death. And we have the same overall response uh, rate. So if you reduce, you still have an efficacy. But if you discontinue, probably you will lose that. And the, uh, the rate of discontinuation was only 7%. And the toxicity was neutropenia and leukopenia. And you know very well nowadays, you know that this Neutropenia is different uh, than what we observe, what we are observing uh, in, in the uh, chemotherapy era. And this data also were consistent, was consistent uh, uh, with, with the other uh, ribocyclib trial, meaning that uh, with this huge number of uh, patients and these three studies can be really easy, easily uh, uh, comfortable with this treatment. And it's important is the fact 
to say that the majority of adverse events were predictable, manageable, and reversible. And really, we had no surprises with uh, such a treatment. The neutropenia was high, but it was manageable with time. And the subsequent treatment were similar between both, between both arms, as you can see, chemotherapy uh, more in the, in, the, in the placebo arm. Uh, because of the early, uh, 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 because we stopped early the treatment, and the for hormonal therapy uh, alone or ho hormonal therapy combination with, for example, uh, the the filvestron or combination, the aromatase inhibitor or filvestron plus uh, aromatase inhibitor plus afinitor also was used. So we can see that there was no big difference between bo uh, both arms in the subsequent line of treatment. When it comes to the delay of chemotherapy, again, young patients, young mothers, there was a delay of the time for the next chemo, for the chemotherapy, and even it was not yet reached in more than 50% of patients in the arm of ribocyclib, while in the arm of endocrine therapy, it's 37 months. So yes, when, you, when, you, when we give this treatment, not only we, we give a benefit in global overall survival, not only we have a good quality of life, not only we decrease, uh, the, the, we shrink the tumor, and remember the time uh, uh, to, uh, to response is the same in, 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 in chemotherapy and in the CDK. It was shown in different studies. You can see that even you delay the administration of chemotherapy, which means you delay even the cost of the treatment because the chemotherapy also is expensive. So from, from this, I can show that the CDK uh, really uh, is prolonging, prolonging the, the survival of breast cancer patients. Uh, and in our case of premenopausal breast can cancer, cancer patients. And ribocyclic plus, plus endocrine therapy is the only one that has two phase three studies confirming this overall survival with 30% reduction in risk. It's the Mona Lisa 3, it's not, it's not uh, our talk today, with a hazard ratio of 0.7 and the Mona Lisa 7 with the same hazard ratio and 009 p-value. And if you take the, the, the patient receiving with aromatase inhibitor, it's really even 0 0.69. So yes, we have to give this treatment. And yes, I made an excellent choice giving ribocyclib to my patients uh, in this case. Adverse event, it's a problem. You know that it's predictable. This should be previous slide. It's predictable, you can resolve it, it's early, it's reversible, whenever you st stop the treatment, it's reversible, uh, 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 it's manageable, it do doesn't look like a, a big problem, so you can manage it. And what's also the advantage, even if it seems not really important when we started seeing this or talking about it, but practically you can feel the difference. It's the only drug where you have to take three, three tablets and you have 200 pills, so it's a three tablets. And since you are decreasing the dose in third of the patients, it means that you can use the same, uh, the same capsules, the same tablets for, uh, for the patient. So if he started with three tablets, then after you decrease the dose, he will use the same uh, 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 flacon, the same, uh, uh, I forgot how you say it in English, the same uh, uh, flacon, okay. And you use two tablets. So it means even you decrease the cost of the treatment. So it's important and in real life, it, it has really uh, a, a, a big meaning. So what, what do I want uh, to tell uh, uh, in this presentation, talking about the CDK inhibitors in breast cancer? And also, I would like to tell you that uh, uh, later on, the next week, in 16 June, we will have also breast cancer session, and we will talk also about uh, these uh, CDK inhibitors. Uh, the message is that CDK inhibitors plus aromatase inhibitors and filvestron is really efficacious in naive patients and pre-exposed one. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the preferred uh, regimen, and when it's affordable, I think it's the regimen. It's used in pre- and uh, postmenopausal uh, uh, women, and in premenopausal, it should be used with ovarian ablation suppression. And uh, the, the adverse event is really uh, uh, profile is, is, is easy to manage. 
the PFS is shown in three molecules, the abema, the palbo, and the ribo. And the overall survival is shown in one study with the abema, but in two studies, phase three studies in ribo. So why ribo? Because it's the only study, the only study using uh, as a criteria premenopausal women, because it has solid clinical data. It has the data from the Mona Lisa 7, where it studied only the premenopausal, and the Mona Lisa 3, where it studied the all the category of, 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 uh, of uh, hormonal patient, hormonal resistant first and second line. And because we, are, we will be waiting the, the data of the aromatase inhibitors. And also I would like to finish, it's my last uh, uh, sentence, saying that the ABC, the ESMO uh, ABC uh, 5 uh, published that the only, uh, the only MBCS score, uh, the only one having a score of five was ribocyclib in the premenopausal trial, Mona Lisa 7, because its efficacy in PFS, overall survival, and uh, uh, quality. So with that, I finish my presentation, and I leave for the floor for our chairman, Dr. Samuel Khatib. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fadi, for the excellent lecture. Uh, we will take, uh, we will <clears throat> keep all the questions for the end of uh, this session. Uh, just to go on time uh, and now we will have the panel discussion which will be done by Dr. Colette Hanna. Uh, she is consultant hemato-oncologist at San Jose Hospital in Beirut and uh, Dr. Hadi Ghanem uh, who is also consultant hemato-oncologist at AUB in Beirut. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you Dr. Farhat. It was an excellent presentation as uh, usual. Hi Dr. Ghanem. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Farhat, Dr. Khatib. Hello, Dr. Colette. Uh, Hi, Dr. Anim. Thank you, Dr. Farhat. Thank you, Dr. Khatib. It was an excellent presentation, as usual. Thank you, and you are welcome. Always your presence is uh, add addition value to our uh, courses. Thank you. <laughs> merci, merci. So, uh, Dr. Farhat, uh, I think you tackled uh, the, the subject uh, very nicely, and I think this is one of the one million dollar question that we have today in our uh, in our practice. Uh, and for for almost maybe ten or fifteen years, we had <coughs> anti-hormonal agents, and then all of a sudden, we have an entire new class with three different uh, drugs that are that belong to the same family. All three are good drugs and uh, competitive and each one of them is trying to find a niche where we could use them in a better way than the other. So here you tackled uh, very nicely the subject of, uh, of treating premenopausal women with, uh, with uh, a CDK4-6 inhibitor, uh, which is, I think is, is a very clean data uh, in, in Mona Lisa 7 that looks specifically at this subset of population. And it is nice, as you uh, very well said as well, the, to see a survive not only a good quality of life, not only a good response rate, not only a PFS advantage, but also an overall survival advantage. So uh, my, my question uh, to you is, is do, you, do you think that this is really a class effect and that the difference that we see in the, uh, in the Paloma, uh, Mona Lisa, and uh, and monarch trials is really due to differences in populations and uh, trial designs, or is really due to uh, a, a better CDK4-6 inhibitor as ribocyclin? But Hadi, you're talking about the fact you know they were more Asian uh, persons in uh, in uh, one of the studies. That's number one. The, the other factor is, is also the, the fact that uh, Mona Lisa 7, 7 is the only uh, pure uh, premenopausal data that we have. I mean, the other, uh, in the Paloma study, for example, there were premenopausal women that were included, but they were included uh, as well as postmenopausal women. So there was no clean data specifically looking at premenopausal. So if we, if we design today a Paloma trial that looks only for premenopausal women, 
Dr. Farhat, Dr. Khatib, do you think will have the same uh, the, the same efficacy, the same overall survival benefit? Hadi. <laughs> Okay. And it's a dangerous question, Dr. It's Farhad. It's a million dollar question, Dr. Farhad. So, so, so uh, thank you, thank you, uh, dear pa panelists. Uh, uh, dear Asma, Dr. Asma Sharifi, I will answer. We have some question I'm uh, seeing, and Dr. Hanna, I will answer this question later on. But to start, indeed, why, uh, why, uh, uh, how to choose uh, the, the treatment when we have uh, similar data and uh, similar drugs uh, between bracket similar drugs. So when you say class effect, we all say that it's a class effect. You know, platinum, carbo and cisplatinum, it's a class effect. When you talk about the anti-EGFR, also it's a class effect, but there is a different toxicity profile and the, uh, there is a difference efficacy. So yes, yes, they all act on CDK. They all inhibit the CDK4-6 specifically. So yes, it might be a class effect, meaning they act on this class, the CDK4 and 6. Remember that there's also other uh, drugs that had efficacy, but they had a lot of toxicity, the, uh, the, the, the other medications. So it, it means that they are from the same group. But you know also very well that in the anti-EGFR, in the platinum salt, you have more toxicity with one drug compared to others, that's we have more efficacy uh, compared to others. And in my opinion, as oncologists, we used to say, if there is no toxicity, there is no efficacy. You remember this very well. In the era of pure chemotherapy, we used to give, for example, the 5-FU. If there is no toxicity, we have to check why. And we used to increase the dose whenever it's possible. And with the antracycline, also we used to increase the dose try to give those dance in breast cancer, saying, saying that, yes, we need that. Uh, we need to increase the dose and to get the maximum result. So yes, when I see toxicity, I'm really happy because I understand it's differently. So yes, there is a different toxicity profile between this medication. And the, probably that's why there's a different efficacy. Indeed, I showed you a slide showing the... Uh, Mona Lisa trial, Paloma trial, and the Monarch trial, and there's a different population. So in my opinion, Mona Lisa took the sensitive in a study and took all others in another study. I'm talking uh, uh, in the postmenopausal, not in the premenopausal, not Mona Lisa. So Mona Lisa two and three are covering all five of patients and might answer for sensitive, yes, you can answer, you can see the Mona Lisa two, and for all others, you can see the Mona Lisa three. That's why I used at this time ribocyclib. I thought that there is more toxicity, probably there is more efficacy, and it was confirmed by the Mona Lisa 7. Now, do, if we do the same trial, I can, nobody can answer. Uh, nobody can answer that, uh, but data is here. And when we say level one evidence, it's level one evidence, it's a phase three trial. That's why we are conducting, participating in phase three trial. That's why our, we are uh, really suffering. You know how much we suffer when you include a patient to convince him and to follow, to make the follow up. Yes, because this data, we are comfortable with it. So now, should I compare the real world data with the history? It's up to you. Every physician will use Hong, his, uh, his, uh, 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 his opinion, decide by himself. But there is no doubt if you have two phase three trials, that probably it's the, 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 uh, the data is here, you have to use it, okay? Yes. So I am convinced. Okay, so if you allow me, there is a question from Asma Sharifi, doctor, uh, or you want, you want to keep it to the end, Dr. Sami? Uh, I think it's better if okay. it will be okay. at the end. So I would like yeah, to okay. have uh, the opinion of a uh, colleague. What about your opinion regarding the question of Hadi? Okay, me, I think, uh, for a long time, we thought it was a class uh, only action uh, drug, in fact. Now, with the Mona Lisa 7 and the latest updates on the Mona Lisa 7, I would be maybe more prone to use the Kiskali more easily if you have a premenopausal woman than another CDK for six in, uh, inhibitor. Uh, probably because of the data that uh, the professor had showed to us in the Mona Lisa 7 and because we have excellent results about it. Uh, for the 
uh, I'll be my sick leave, uh, maybe I will see also the toxicity profiles of every drug to see if I can give it to this person or not. If we have a lot of cardiac toxicities or a QT that is long for the Kiskali. And uh, I had a question also about the visceral metastasis because in uh, some of the studies, they were patients with the visceral metastasis that were included more than in other studies. So maybe if we have visceral metastasis, we will be more prone also to go for one instead of the other. But of course, as guideline, whatever we use, I'm, we are, you know, we are in, the, in, the good, uh, in the good guidelines, if you want. But if we want to refine a little bit our decision, maybe we have to think more case by case. I don't know what do you think, Dr. Farhat, about it. Uh, the data about the visceral metastasis, it was also shown in, in these trials, in the uh, Mona Lisa trial. And uh, the Abima is, uh, uh, is, is claiming and uh, the data is showing a benefit in the, in the uh, uh, response rate for visceral metastasis only. But there is no difference in, in other uh, subgroups. That's why they are claiming. While here, the, the, in all subgroups, you have a benefit in overall survival. So I, I think uh, uh, you can use, as you said, whatever you want, but the it depends on of, of your parameters to choose the treatment. But all subgroups were positive in the Mona Lisa 7, and uh, even with or without visceral, it was positive. So it's up to you. I so yani, what we're saying, and now, finalement, Whatever we choose as CDK for six, uh, it's um, and we don't uh, we don't you don't have a preference when a person when a patient goes into your clinic you don't have really a preference for one versus the other. Can you, we, we are talking about the same thing again. I have my preferences. I have based on the data. So please show me data and uh, and, and and see my and you will get my answer. I take the data, the, I, we always, all oncologists will take the data. It depends on your parameters. You may believe in real world data, you may believe in phase three, you may ah, believe okay. in, so in guidelines. Uh, Remember that yeah. many KOL are saying that it's, it's a class effect, but personally, in, in, in specific cases, I will use ribocyclib like in this patient because I, I think I need, uh, a, 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 let's say, an, an aggressive. Uh, uh, treatment. I need a good response. Okay. And I think I agree with Dr. Farhat about the fact that, I mean, us as oncologists nowadays, with the wealth of data that we have coming from all over the place, it is important to stick to labor. In the premenopausal setting, at least, uh, and uh, this is different from the postmenopausal setting, it would be more debatable, but at least in the premenopausal setting, it's nice to see overall survival data. Uh, from uh, one, I think this will give the edge over the other. And we have to go with the data, we have to believe what we have. And today, the, the, the only data that we have in premenopausal that has shown overall survival advantage is with, uh, with uh, ribocyclob. So I think, as Dr. Farhat mentioned, we have to believe this data. This, this data might be duplicated again in other places. We, we don't know, we will have to wait and see. But for now, my personal opinion is that we have to go with what we have and the data is, is clean and I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it favors ribocyclib in this setting. I like the word clean. I haven't used yes. it. Hello, yeah. two, two new all, words. All of us will see. Class, class and clean. Class and clean. So if you fresh, allow fresh. me, yeah, fresh, if you allow me now just for the time. Uh, to introduce our next speakers, uh, Colette and Hadi, we will have more discussion after uh, the lecture of our uh, colleague, uh, Prof. Joseph Qattan, who is the head of the hematology department at Hotel Dieu uh, de France Hospital in Beirut. And he will talk about the second line treatment. Please, Dr. Joseph. Thank you, Dr. Sami. And thank you, Fadi, for this invitation. And my talk will be about switching to second line hormonal treatment. So why we have to switch patients who respond to hormonal therapy to second line? In fact, these patients will acquire the resistance. For instance, it could be 
in the left of the screen, ESR1 mutation, for instance. On the right of the screen, it could be the activation of the complex CDK46 cycling D. And this uh, uh, way of, uh, of resistance is now uh, uh, controlled by the availability of the CDK46 inhibitors. And the third mechanism of escape is the uh, mutation of the pathway PI, PI3K. So when we have mutation at the level of PI3K, that means we will have a cell proliferation and the percentage of mutation of PI3K in luminal A, luminal B breast cancer is around 40%. So we have a high prevalence of mutation of PI3K. This is, uh, was recorded in the, in the Occidental patients. Do we know the percentage of mutation of PI3K in our population? Not yet. So I invite investigators to do this research and look for the prevalence of PI3K in Lebanon, in Jordan, in the Arab region, it will be very interesting. Once we have <coughs> the mutation, that means these patients will proliferate independently from the blockage of hormones, and it will also enhance, or it will also have an impact in the insulin signaling pathway. So we can imagine that once we will block this PI3K mutation, by an, an, an inhibition or an inhibitor, that means this will have an impact on the uh, uh, glycemia equilibrium. So we can have hyperglycemia. How we can uh, test uh, or we can assess the mutation in our patients? The technique that it's wise or widely used and especially uh, used in Solar One, it's the PCR. Also, there is this, the, the uh, reference uh, method of NGS, uh, new generation sequencing. It's uh, more accurate, in fact, and it's more sensitive. Even the NG NGS can detect some additional PI3K mutation that are not detected by the PCR. Uh, uh, what is the best uh, uh, tissue or the, or the best uh, uh, zone to be tested? Usually, we are testing a tissue from the primary or from, from the metastasis, but also we can test from the plasma. We can test the circulating DNA tumoral, and uh, it's also a valid way and uh, also accurate as, uh, as much as the uh, tissue. Uh, when to, to perform the PI3K mutation, I think the best time is when we have metastatic disease. Because as Dr. Fadi Farhat said, uh, we planify the algorithm of treatment at the beginning. So we planify the sequencing uh, of the treatment at the beginning. What is the best uh, uh, PI3K inhibitor? The best PI3K inhibitor is the BYL, the alpha-lizib. Why? Because it is a specific against alpha isoform of the PI3K. There's four isoforms. The best, the best uh, uh, inhibition which will be on the uh, alpha, like with the alpha-lizib. So that means it's active and it's less toxic amongst other different PI3K inhibitors. And in fact, in fact, we have in the literature published in 2018, a phase 1B that includes heavily pretreated patients with the PI3K mutation, and the alpha was combined with fulvestrin, and patients have an enhancement of their progression-free survival, since the progression-free survival in these heavily pretreated patients was 9.1 months. Based on this positive phase 1B trial, there was a, a, a phase 3 trial uh, uh, designed by, by, by Novartis, and Novartis was very picky on the choice of patients. So we have a clear definition of the uh, selection of patients to be included. There is a three scenario of patients to be included, included in Solar One. The first scenario, are patients who get neoadjuvant 
or adjuvant therapy, and they relapse less than one year of off therapy. And then when they relapse, they are included. The other group of patients are patients who received neoadjuvant or adjuvant, and they relapse after more than one year of off therapy. And these patients have to get to relapse to get the first line of hormonal therapy. And, th and then when they relapse, they are included. And the third the category of patients are patients who get at the beginning a metastatic disease and they progress on hormone therapy. And then when they progress, they get the second line, they are included. And, and forget about the first line because this category of patients was excluded after. So we have three types of patients ending with two types of included patients either patients included in first line, and this is the case of the first scenario, or included in second line, and this is the case of second and third scenario. So patients who were previously pretreated pre as first line or second line, they were included in the SOLAR1 study. The SOLAR1 study will dispatch or will divide the patients in two categories. Patients who have PI3K mutation, and the mutation was performed centrally by a central lab. Those who have PI3K mutation, they, they, they represent a cohort of 341 patients, and patients without mutation, another cohort of 231. We can't forget about the, the, the non-mutant cohort. Let, let's fix on the mutant cohort of the third, 341 patients. These mutant cohort will be randomized in two arms. The arm with alpelizib 300 mg per day plus fulvestrin, and the arm placebo plus fulvestrin. Also, we have the same, uh, uh, the same uh, uh, randomization in the second cohort, but the primary endpoint was the PFS and PI3K mutant cohort. Secondary endpoints were overall survival in the mutant, PFS in the mutant and non-mutant, PFS in mutant but, but tested according to the plasma, overall survival, objective response, and safety. This is the table summarizing the patient's characteristics. Let's go, let's see the first part of the table concerning the cohort of PI3K mutant. Uh, for metastasis, and liver, uh, 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 for liver and, and, and lung metastasis, that means visceral metastasis, we have almost 50% of patients in each arm, in the alpha-lizib and the placebo. For patients in first and second metastasis, almost they were half-half in each arm. For patients with primary resistant to endocrine therapy, according to the ESMO definition, we have around 20% primary resistant. And, second, uh, and secondary resistance in 70%. And what, sh what is interesting, there is at the end of the table, a minority of patients, a handful group of patients who had CDK46 in the previous line. Uh, and certainly these patients were treated as second line. And uh, the number of these patients in the alpelizib arm, I took mutant I3K, is a nine patient and the placebo arm, 11 patients. Even this patient will be analyzed, but, but we will get some kind of idea about the effect of, of PI3K inhibitor in patients receiving CDK46. This is uh, the, the primary endpoint of the SOLAR1. It was clearly positive in favor of the alpelizib arm. Here we have the curve in blue for alpelizib for Vestrand and in red for placebo for Vestrand. And the median PFS was 11 months with alpelizib compared to 5.7 for the placebo. Here, we divide the patient in two groups. In the left, patients who received the alpelizib as first line and the, uh, to the right as second line. And here, we have almost the same difference in progression-free survival. And the median PFS for alpelizib full vestrant in first line was 11 months compared to 6.2 with the placebo. And to the right, we have the median PFS of 10.9 months for alpelizib compared to 3.7 with the placebo. It's, it's interesting to note that the magnitude of the PFS difference or the gain of, of, of PFS was higher 
when the alpilizib was used in second line. In second line, that means the difference 10.9 versus 3.7. 3.7. Here we have the uh, uh, water flow uh, uh, representing the patient who respond. We have to the left uh, the blue water flow showing the response or, or the tumor shrinkage in patients who receive alpilizib, and it was 75.8. And to the right, patients who receive uh, placebo, it was 49.5. And concerning the objective response, it was also in favor of alpilizib, 26.6 objective response in the alpilizib arm compared to 12.2, 12.8 in the placebo arm. Here we have a, a trend in overall survival benefit in favor of alpilizib, we have to, to wait and, and we need more follow-up. And uh, this slide summarizes the PFS of patients who have PI3K mutation detected by plasma, by circulating tumor DNA. In fact, we have the same shape of the PFS, the same difference in favor of alpilizib. If we look to the table to the right, patients with PI3K mutation in plasma who, who, who get alpilizib have a, have a median PFS of 10.9, uh, and patients who get only uh, uh, full percent with placebo, the median PFS was 3.7. Also, the difference was, was significant, and it seems that reflecting DNA is approved uh, and valid as a replacement for tissue uh, assessment of uh, the mutation. <clears throat> Let's move now to the safety, to the toxicity. We have to keep in our minds three typical toxicity of the alpilizib. The first one is hyperglycemia, the second one is diarrhea, and the third one is rash. The hyperglycemia, as I said in the mechanism of action, it's, it's, it's related to the uh, insulin signaling. So the hyperglycemia grade three was uncounted in 32% of patients, the diarrhea grade three in 6.7 of patients, and the rash was a, a, a grade three in 9.9 .9 of patients. These uh, toxicity, the three toxicity have a different timing in the course of the treatment. The uh, hyperglycemia and rash occurred usually in the first month, while the diarrhea can occur at any time in the treatment. If we look to the slide, to the uh, right side down, we have a table summarizing the median time to onset of the toxicity. Hyperglycemia need on a median of 15 days, starting from the beginning of the treatment. The rash, 13 days, after the initiation of the treatment. Diarrhea, it could be 139. And the days to, to the toxicity improve or resolve, hyperglycemia needs six days after interruption or after dose reduction, and the rush 11 days, and the diarrhea 18 days. Some characteristics of these three toxicities. For, for instance, the hyperglycemia, we have to expect hyperglycemia at the beginning. We have to follow and be aware about the, this uh, toxicity. So we have to test the, the hemoglobin test and the glycemia. And at the beginning of the increase of glycemia, we have to start with metformin. Do not hesitate to start the metformin. Even in some, uh, some patients in the right of the, the table on the right in the, the upper part, uh, we have a uh, few patients that need two anti-diabetic drugs, three or even four diabetic uh, drugs. For the diarrhea, once it's appeared, it's very simple. We prescribe loperamide like other di diarrhea of any TKIs. And uh, the table on the right showed that the prescription of metformin as anti-diabetic did not increase the diarrhea. Concerning the third toxicity, the rash, the, the story is more simple. It's easy. If, if we give prophylactic anti-rash medication at the beginning, the percentage of diarrhea will decrease uh, tremendously. 
So let's take a look on these two common bears, the blue, uh, the blue, the, the uh, light blue and the dark blue represent the percentage of, 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 of rash. On the left, these patients get a prophylactic anti-rash medication. That's why the percentage of rash was limited to 27%. To the right, these patients didn't get prophylactic anti-rash anti medication, and the percentage of patients who present rash was almost 64%. Another interesting thing in the solar one is what we call the, the, the uh, uh, learning curve. Uh, we are presenting on this table uh, the, the uh, 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 blue column representing the incidence of side effect and the incidence of interruption of the drug because of side effect. So the blue lines represent these incidents in the first half of patients included, and the yellow lines represent these incidents in the second half of patients included. So it's a way to, to, to say that investigators and physicians, when they're, they are aware and familiar with the toxicity, can reduce the toxicity and can re reduce the incidence of interruption of the drug. So the lesson from the adverse event, very easy. We have to use prophylactic antihistamine to prevent the rash. We have to optimize medical management for adverse events such as metformin for hyperglycemia and loperamide for diarrhea. And this is the last slide concerning the solar one. I kept it to the end for purpose. Why? This is the representation of the PFS of the two small groups of patients, nine patients in the alpilizib and 11 patients in the fulvestrant arm. And according to the slide, the median PFS for patients who get CDK46 in the previous treatment have a median PFS of 5.5, and those who get placebo and fulvestrant have only 1.8. So according to the small group, patients who get in the first line CDK46 will benefit from the PI3K uh, inhibitor. Is it enough to conclude with this small number of patients? I think no. Are you following me? Because now we will move to the unmet need of these patients who are treated with CDK, CDK inhibitors who have PI3K mutated and they progress. The unmet need was behind the uh, establishment of the BI-LEAVE study, the design of BI-LEAVE. It's the first and only prospective trial evaluating alpelizib plus endocrine therapy in patients with PI3K mutation HER2 positive, luminal A, luminal B, previously treated with CDK uh, inhibitor. In fact, 10 days ago in the ASCO 2000, in 20, uh, uh, Rugo presented a part of the BILIB. These are the cohort of patients who get alpelizib plus fulvestrant in patients who have the mutation of PI3K and who progress on CDK46 uh, CDK inhibitor. This is the initial design of the study. Patients with the previous hormonal therapy, uh, including CDK46, are included but they have the mutation all the patients have the mutation and at the initiation of the study they were divided not randomized it's a phase two uh, study patients were, were divided in two groups patients who get the immediate prior treatment with cdk for six inhibitors and aromatase alpelizib plus fulvestrant and the cohort b is patients uh, uh, as patients who get in the beginning the prior treatment CDK uh, inhibitor plus fulvestrant, they are called cohort B and they will receive alpelizib plus uh, litrozole. And uh, in February 2019, there was an uh, amendment and there was a third, uh, uh, third arm added 
including patients who received multiple lines of hormones and chemotherapy or with or without CDK4-6. It's called the cohort C, C and the treatment in cohort C is alpelizib plus fulvestrin. So the presentation by Irugo was reporting only the patients in cohort A, patients who get alpelizib plus fulvestrin after progressing to CDK4-6 and aromatase inhibitor. Something interesting was the end point. It's not a classical end point. It's the proportion of patients who remain alive and without the progression at six months. There was also, also second, uh, secondary endpoints like PFS, objective response, overall survival. I will not uh, talk about it now, and the safety. So this is the distribution of the patients. There was, in the I'm talking cohort A, in cohort A, there was 127 patients enrolled, 127 who get the primary uh, drug, but six in, uh, excluded because the, the, the mutation was not confirmed by the central lab. And to the left, there's a table summarizing the patient characteristics. Uh, uh, the eco 2 was allowed in 1.6. These are the different lines of treatment, especially hormonal treatment given, giving, uh, uh, given to these patients before include, uh, inclusion. A uh, patient maybe get one line in 77%, two line in 11%. Uh, fulvestrant was not allowed because these patients will get fulvestrant and alpelizib. Chemotherapy in 6.3. And this is the slide showing the primary endpoint. The primary endpoint is the patients who were alive without disease progression at six months. There was 50.4%, half of the patients were not progressing uh, 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 at six months following the treatment. So the, the, the uh, uh, goal of the study was met. And also concerning the PFS, this is the curve at the right, and the median PFS with alpelizib and fulvestrin was 7.3 months. This is the objective response. The objective response in the whole population, in the whole group was 17.4, and, and in the group with miserable disease was 21%. The clinical benefit, including objective response plus stable disease, was 45.5 in all patients and 42% in patients with a miserable disease. This is to the, to the left, the water flow showing the shrinkage of patients in the, uh, in the cohort A in the bi-leave. We have a, sh a shrinkage in almost 70.1%. And uh, Rugo, during his presentation at ASCO, he tried to compare with the solar one, uh, 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 with solar one with cohort mutation. He, he, he sh showed us that we have almost the same percentage of response in solar one. In fact, the percentage of uh, shrinkage was 79.9%, uh, al almost the same percentage as by leave as solar one. Concerning the side effects, the serious side effect was encountered the grade three in 24% of patients. Adverse event leading to discontinuation according to the protocol were, were 20.5%. What are the toxicity encountered? It's the, the same like solar, as I said, the hyperglycemia, the diarrhea, the rash. There is others, fatigue, uh, stomatitis, etc., but not very important. For the diarrhea, grade three was 5.5. For the, for the hyperglycemia, 28.3. And for the rash, it was 9.4. However, in the by leave, on the left of the slide, despite the adverse event leading to discontinuation and a, 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 a momentum, a, a, a limited in time discontinuation, despite these side effects, uh, despite the occurrence of these side effects in 20.5%, the median relative dose intensity of the alpelizib was 89.9. So the, the, the median dose intensity remains high. Also, Rugo compared the median dose intensity with solar one, and in solar one, it showed 83.7. If we can have 
more detail, for example, the hyperglycemia as a reason for discontinuation was in by 1.6%, while the hyperglycemia in solar one was 6.3%. So even maybe with time, with the, with the uh, learning curve, uh, physicians have uh, uh, more, uh, more uh, familiarity with the drug and to pre and more prevention of the toxicities. Another interesting thing done by, by, by Rugo, he compared the 121 patients of cohort A who get alpilizib plus full vestrant according to the Bileev with another matched 95 patients uh, who were, uh, who were, uh, uh, who were uh, uh, found in a uh, FMI clinical genomics database. So he compared these patients in the study to the real-world patients. These real-world matched patients are patients who have uh, CDK4-6 previous treatment, and, and these patients had also PI3K mutation. In fact, in real world, uh, these 95 patients were treated as this table. Capicitabine in 14.7%. Fulvestrant monotherapy in 14.7, fulvestrant palbociclib pal pal in 13.7, everolimus eczemestain 11.6, fulvestrant litrozole palbociclib 5.3. So in fact, that what are we prescribing outside the trial? These are the five options that these patients, the 95 patients, get in real life. And what he present in this slide, it's something very interesting. He, uh, he, he tried to adjust the two population to get the must match criteria. And uh, in the first line, when it was unadjusted results, the PFS was 7.3 in by leaf compared to the uh, 3.6 in the real world uh, patients. When <coughs> weighted by oats, 7.3 compared to 3.7. Always the PFS is higher in by leave and the propensity score matching 8 versus 3.5 and the exact matching, even with the exact matching, the PFS was in favor of the by leave 6.5 compared to 3.4. So to conclude, uh, I'm concluding only the, the uh, uh, presentation part. The conclusion is Alpilizib is the first PI3K inhibitor to have a clinical mini meaningful and statistics activity in patients with the PI3K mutation. The PFS according to SOLAR1 is 11 months compared to 5.7. The by leave results support the use of alpilizib plus fulvestrin in luminal A, luminal B with, P, uh, with uh, PI3K mutation and confirms the data from SOLAR that three toxicity hyperglycemia rash and diarrhea are well, uh, well managed uh, by education, proactive monitoring, dose modification, and concomitant medical intervention. And the question remind, re remain at the end, when and how to incorporate into the current treatment algorithm the PI3K inhibitors? Is it sequentially after CDK4-6 inhibitors, like in SOLAR1 and BILEAV, or it could be upfront? Thank you for your attention for the first part because I have three slides to present a clinical case. Uh, 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 are you following me? Yeah, we are following you. Okay. So uh, uh, I present here only the, our, our part or our exper exper um, experience with the Solar One, my, uh, my uh, hospital or my department were involved in, in the solar one, I was a principal investigator, and I included in 2016 four patients. These four, four patients were divided: two premenopausal, two postmenopausal. Two of them get the the drug uh, alpilizib, uh, the drug uh, plus fulvestrin in first line, and two patients in second line. And the uh, median PFS with patient number one, uh, you look to the table, patient number one, median PFS three well, was not very famous. The second median PFS again, uh, second patient eight months. The first patient 
median PFS of seven months, it was uh, acceptable. But the third patient had an ongoing PFS after 41 months of starting the therapy. Uh, for the uh, survival, as per May 220, two patients uh, died. These two patients are patient one and patient four. And the patients who remain alive, patient two have 49 months overall survival, but she is progressing under chemotherapy. And the third patient is, has 49 overall survival, and she's still in remission. And I will show you the detail or the clinical presentation of the patient number three. It's a 51-year-old perimenopausal woman. She presented in March 2011 a, a right breast mass with right axillary enlargement. She had a biopsy proven that there is a ductal carcinoma, hormone receptor positive, RB2 negative. She get primary chemotherapy, six cycles of neoadjuvant, and in August 2011, she had a radical mastectomy along with axillary dissection, and the tumor was five centimeter, SBR1. There was zero lymph node, over 15 resected, and the tumor were, were, were replaced by the necrosis, hormone receptor positive, RB2 negative. She had adjuvant irradiation and adjuvant hormonal therapy starting in January 2012. She get the sequential adjuvant because her age, tamoxifen, then aromatase inhibitor, and in March 2016, where, while she was under aromatase inhibitor, and namely letrozole, she had an increase in CI15, CA15-3, and she complained from right shoulder, right pain, and, 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 right, and a pain from in her right shoulder. The PET scan confirmed the presence of multiple bone metastases. There was also a newborn biopsy, proven that the disease is relapsing with the same characteristics. And in May 2016, she was included in Solar One study. At the beginning, she had the three toxicities. After two weeks, she had a grade three rash. And according to the protocol, the drug must be interrupted for a few days until recovery. When she recovered with treatment uh, with prednisone, she got another time the same drug with the same dosage and the rash relapsed. So there was another interruption and reduction of the dose per the protocol. And she is receiving deslarotadine all the time in continuous. And the alpilizib was, continued, was uh, uh, resumed since that time with the dose of 200 milligram, milligram, 250 milligram per day instead of 300 milligram. At one month, she had hyperglycemia and the metformin was immediately prescribed and she continued to have metformin till now. After two months, she get an episode of diarrhea. She get loperamide and the uh, diarrhea resolved. Two, a few months ago also, she get another episode of the diarrhea and was treated also successfully. Now in May 22, after four years and the patient still on alpilizib, plus uh, full vestrant, the patient is alive, PS0 with stable asymptomatic bone disease, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Joseph, for the excellent presentation, and uh, the case that, that you present, it was very clear that alpilizib is important in some cases to be treated with. Uh, so we'll have the floor now for Dr. Colette and Dr. Hadi for five minutes as a panelist to discuss uh, any questions with Dr. Joseph. And uh, later, we'll start answering the questions of uh, all the attendees. Thank you, Dr. Atan. It was uh, really clear. And uh, I don't know if Dr. Ghanem is with us also now. Yes. Yes, okay. that was perfect. Thank you, Dr. Katam. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ghanem, as I understood, uh, you had also a case uh, uh, with, uh, with the drug. You have an experience with the drug also? Uh, yes, I do. Actually, uh, Dr. Katam, it's very interesting to see how your patient number three did uh, on the drug. And it's uh, 
very nice to see her, her continuous response and she's still in, in good uh, uh, stable disease uh, four years now on treatment, which is, uh, which is uh, very exciting. Uh, so a few things that I would like to point out from, from your case and from your presentation. So number one, we can see that uh, obviously uh, some patients do uh, better than others, but uh, actually some of them do uh, really very well. And uh, as far as the efficacy of the drug, it's it's nice to see that uh, it, it is not a, a mutation that uh, that is uncommon. It is, is quite it is quite common, and um, and a, a nice number of patients would respond to the drug, and some of them do have a, a long duration of uh, of response. What I think is, is important to, to mention uh, as well is, is the practical part about the, uh, the testing, number one, and also the management of the, of the side effects. So in, regard, uh, in regards to the testing, I think today we have to address the issue of, of where, where and, uh, and when to perform this testing. So as far as where to perform the testing, um, I don't think that we have any approved center in Lebanon that can that can do the testing. So uh, I know that. Lana, we're doing it via more next generation sequencing uh, until now, or someone did it uh, by PCR in the. From all of us, did someone did it in PCR? But not but yet. To my knowledge, the PCR yeah. it's an easy technique, but the kit and uh, the material is not available in Lebanon. The NGS theoretically exist in two lab in Lebanon, but are not functional. Uh, and uh, um, I think we can, we can discuss this opportunity of Vic Novartis or, of, uh, or with the private laboratory to, to get the drug or the material outside Lebanon. Okay, because it will be also a financial problem if we need to do an NGS a complete panel with the, uh, with the companies that we have now in Lebanon it will be very expensive just to get this information. In fact, if we don't want to have the, all the other information, don't you think so, Dr. Aftan and Dr. Hanem? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, the patients that I presented, uh, Hadi, the patients that I presented, it's part of the Solar One. Yeah. So the test was done not in Lebanon, it was done according to the trial in the central lab. And we were not aware till now because it's a, a, a uh, bl uh, bl some kind of blinded uh, test. Uh, uh, we are not sure about the mutation, uh, but uh, even we were not sure about the drug. Uh, what if, if she is getting the alpilizib or the placebo? But, but in fact, because she manifested the toxicities, we oh, were knew. Uh, retrospectively <laughs> sure that she get the drug. And since she had a a, a, a PFS lasting uh, for for years, so it must be a mutation inside her tumor. Yes. Okay, I can okay. add, dear panelists, just to say that the PI three K, the PIK three C eight mutation will will be covered by Novartis soon because they will uh, be running a trial. I don't know if I am uh, allowed to say that, but. So it, it will not be a, a difficult problem, but I agree with, mm. the, with, with the speakers and with panelists. Uh, the issue is, uh, should we do the, uh, the test up front or in second line or even uh, in adjuvant setting? So there's a lot of, of discussion because as Dr. Khatan showed, we can use the alpelizib in the first line or in the second line and both it's okay. Uh, should we use it before CDK or after also we we don't know, but we can use it after. So, so there's a lot of question, but when we will uh, start trying it, uh, it will be fantastic. And also I'd, I'd like to mention that I have, uh, I have a pay, uh, also we included patients in the trial and we have uh, patients with the similar survival. And also I have outside the clinical trial, the solar one patients where we discovered the uh, pic 3 ca mutation but it was also NGS. So there is no way in Lebanon to do it, only sending outside. And uh, just for the, the social security here, Dr. Atan, uh, yes. if we send, uh, you know, the NGS that we send uh, for the social security, would you yes. are they accepting it in the, this setting or not? Because they are only accepting it uh, after standard of care. Yeah. 
Um, I think according to the criteria now for the reimbursement of uh, the uh, caries or foundation, mm -hmm. looking for all the uh, uh, table of NGS mutation, the criteria at the, uh, at the social security uh, um, uh, implement the, uh, the, the that the patient progressed after all the standard therapy so it will be accepted after multiple lines of hormonal so not in the place that we want to do therapy yani that will represent the uh, cohort c of the by leave mm. in fact so, so Nana, we want to do it before, I think. If we or... want to do it at the metastatic time, as Fadi Farhad said, and I repeat what he said during my presentation, to have to to have the plan at the beginning and the sequence and the algorithm of treatment when the patient is metastatic. So you would like to do it at the metastasis, at first but, but, metastasis. Yes, ideally, yes, but the security, social security will not reimburse at this stage, the... the uh, uh, so ideally, the, yani when you have a metastatic uh, uh, patient, uh, you would like to have the PIC kind. At, not at the adjuvant, uh, uh, at the, not at the adjuvant. early stage, but when it is metastatic, it's better to have the PI3K and to um, uh, planify the algorithm and the second line and the third line uh, consequently. Thank you, thank you for the excellent discussion. And let us now answer some questions uh, for Dr. Fadi Farahat and for Dr. Joseph. Please, if you would like to start, Dr. Fadi, with the questions that you have in your screen, just to click in Q and A. Yes, I have. I have seen the question. Uh, thank you for the panelists and thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Um, uh, the, the, very nice question. The patient presented visceral crisis. Why you didn't start with chemotherapy? Uh, yes, it's true. She's premenopausal. We prefer usually chemotherapy. Uh, she's in visceral crisis and really aggressive disease. So why not chemotherapy? Indeed, because I have a big, big experience with CDK inhibitors. And oh, yes. I believe uh, that... And I, I think, uh, and I think that is given the same result. So since the time to response is not uh, uh, is, is is not uh, uh, worse than the uh, uh, than the uh, the chemotherapy, and since the quality is better, that's why I decided to start with uh, Kiskali with ribocyclib. It's my experience allowing me to uh, to use this treatment. There is no data. Uh, saying that you can use it in, 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 in visceral crisis, but I'm using it because I had a big experience. And now there's a, a trial, the right choice, where they are exploring the chemotherapy versus the CDK inhibitors only in visceral crisis. So that's why I use the, uh, this treatment. So that's why. Uh, uh, Dr. Khatib, can I uh, have a comment here also? The uh, bone marrow infiltration, it's true, it's a visceral, uh, the bone marrow is a visceral uh, organ. But when we have infiltration with a, a solid tumors, it's better to treat slowly with some drug who have a slow activity than to treat aggressively with chemotherapy and induce a tumor lysis syndrome and tumor lysis and the pancytopenia that will be consequent. So it's very wise in this case uh, to, to have to treat with hormonal therapy or with the double CDK46 and hormonal therapy instead of chemotherapy. Despite that, this is a visceral disease. But what we are, when we talk with visceral crisis, usually we are talking about the visceral and, or, and liver and lung, and we forget this low percentage of bone marrow and it's an exception in mode marrow. It's better to go slowly with a slow drugs than with the aggressive chemotherapy. Uh, Dr. Fadi, would you like uh, to answer the questions of uh, Dr. Rahana. Lush and Dr. Oson? They are uh, uh, waiting okay. for the answer. Yeah. 
I will start with the question of Dr. Hanna Kahouch. I think, I, I hope I pre I have a premenopausal menopausal, uh, patient with metastatic breast cancer to the bone. Uh, luminal A progressed on aromazine plus fuzlodex. I want, to, I want to add her, to put her on ribocyclib. What, uh, in, what, what do you recommend uh, besides the Zol Zoladex and Exgiva? I don't know. The Zoladex, what to give? So the question is, there is a first line aromazine with fuzlodex. So what will be the second line if we put ribocyclib? Okay. I think we have to put an aromatase inhibitors. The aromazine is a steroidal. We can put non-steroidal non aromatase inhibitors like, uh, uh, like uh, anastrazole or litrozole. So uh, you can't give a ribocyclib alone. There is a few data on the ribocyclib alone, but uh, they, have, they don't have the approval for that. The only approval is, is for abimacyclib in, in, in first line in third and more. But in second line, you can use ribocyclib plus any aromatase inhibitor if you want to use it, but not the aromazine for sure. Okay. Thank and you, Dr. Fahadi. Thank you. And I don't see the question of Dr. Rosen. He's rising his, his hand. We can take him live. You can take me live. Good evening, everybody. Hi. Hello, Fadi. Hello, Hi. Jose. Hi. Dr. Rosen. Hello. Hello, Dr. Khatib. Hello, Hadi. Hello, Colette. Thank you very much for this is very, very, very interesting discussion. Uh, amazing discussion with also the latest up, updates from ASCO 2020. It was only a few days ago. So really, thank you very much for all these updates. I have a question for all the panel. You have discussed a lot on the sequencing of the drugs and the sequencing that we have in treating metastatic breast cancer. What would happen if for any reason you have a patient who already received filvestra, he already received combination CDK inhibitor with filvestra. So he comes today with the PYK3 mutation and you would like to give him alpelisib. So I don't know, are you comfortable on just switching uh, I'll pass it, I'll, uh, switching from CDK inhibitor to alpelisib and continuing filvestran, or you would like to also out of uh, any data because we don't have data combine alpelisib with aromatase inhibitor, for example. I don't know if you heard me very well. I can answer. Yes, just. Hello, me, Marwan, or Sami, can I answer? Yes, please. Well, so the and we will get to soon the answer from the BioLeave uh, study. In fact, the uh, second uh, group, the second cohort, the cohort B, are for these patients who get previous uh, line CDK46 inhibitors plus fulvestrin, and the the uh, uh, experimental uh, this group will get according to the design of Bileave the combination of aromatase inhibitor uh, uh, plus alpelizib. So there is a place of alpelizib after CDK46 and full vestrant with aromatase inhibitor. So we can guarantee that there is a second line, a combination second line. Did I answer your question? Yes. I, I think so. Huh? Can I add something? Fadi has a comment. Surely, yes. Fadi, I want you to add. Can I, dear uh, chairman? Well, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, indeed, the PI3K inhibition. Please, in brief, uh, because might... we are short of time and we are too late for okay. our participants. Five. Okay. Uh, okay, quickly. So, just because the PI3K should work. Uh, with 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 the inhibition of ER, so we have always to give a treatment. Now, even if it was given previously, it should be added. A short answer. We have a lot a lot of questions, Doctor Sam. I don't know. I have a premenopausal a patient with luminal A. We said that. Thank you for this excellent presentation. My question was: Is which is the best uh, sequencing? for menopausal women, especially without CDK inhibitors. So uh, without CDK inhibitors, 
You can start with aromatase inhibitors. Then after you give, if you wish, fulvestrone or uh, aroma or, or uh, uh, Afinito, what we call uh, Everolimus mm. plus endocrine Everolimus. therapy. It depends again on your strategy because we know nowadays that filvestron has a higher response than anastrozole aromatase inhibitor. You can start with filvestron or with aromatase inhibitor after or switch vice versa. Uh, this depends on the, uh, on, on, on the treatment, on the conditions of the patients, on her quality of life, on her needs. You might start by the injection, then after uh, the aromatase inhibitor. So there is no rule, but it's good to add the uh, the uh, everolimus in second line. With so if you start with the uh, filvestron, you can give second line uh, everolimus with aromatase inhibitor. The floor is yours, Doctor Sami. Uh, I think uh, it's okay now. And uh, just to answer the last question of Zainab. Uh, the speakers will share, inshallah, soon their emails for more questions and for any further coordination and cooperation with all uh, of you and with all of the centers in our MENA area and even in Iran and the other countries. So uh, the floor is yours, uh, Dr. Farhat, to have the closure. Okay, so thank you uh, very much, uh, dear uh, speakers. Dear Dr. Katan, dear panelists, thank you for Dr. Sami for uh, uh, being the chairman. Uh, I would like to an announce for our colleague before presenting the, uh, thank you for the attendees specifically. Uh, I want to announce uh, that we are thinking about doing with Dr. Sami, we are organizing the ABC en français, ABC, ABC en français, the ABC in French language. Uh, so uh, it's, it will be for our francophone col colleagues in, uh, in the Maghreb and in, in the region in Lebanon and Syria. Uh, first, uh, second, uh, uh, please for those who are interested and those uh, who would like to uh, attend again, we have the next week uh, uh, the chairman will be uh, a, a second, uh, chairman Dr. Samuel Khatib. Uh, speakers will be Dr. Najis Sagir and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Marwan Ghosn and uh, probably myself, and it will be also on breast cancer. Uh, third, there is a nice uh, commercial uh, video that I would like to, uh, to, cl to close the session with, uh, and uh, we will be ready, and then, so we will send the presentation for all attendees, uh, and we will be happy to hear from you uh, some comments. Thank you very much, and thank, thank you, Sans Pro. You can go for the uh, video. There is no voice, Carla. Thank you very much. With that, uh, it's the, the end of the first uh, session of ABC. Thank you and uh, see you on the next webinar, the 16th June. I'm sorry, I haven't presented uh, the other uh, session. We will send it by email. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye everybody. Bye bye, au revoir les amis. Merci. Bye, thank you, thank you.
Thank you. You are welcome and see you all next time very soon, inshallah. Inshallah, very soon.